Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Gerson, and I am the Optometric Medical Director of the Macular Degeneration Association. Uh, we're so glad that you joined us today for our uh, webinar talking about diabetes, uh, eye care and diabetes, and hopefully lots of great questions inter and interactions from you. Uh, I'm here with my good friend and fellow optometrist, Dr. Paul Chaus. Uh, we're actually in San Diego at uh, an academic meeting for optometrists. Uh, so that's why you see we're in a hotel room instead of our normal office setting. Um, but really glad to have you here with us. Uh, if this is the first time that you've joined one of these webinars, just real quickly, Macular Degeneration Association was founded in 2007. Uh, the uh, president and really founder is Larry Hoffheimer. And really what prompted him to start the MDA was that he witnessed his mother uh, losing vision to macular degeneration. And he really wanted to see if more could be done uh, for her, for others, to help educate and to try to help really change things for people that have macular degeneration. So that's why he founded the association. And then actually Larry himself has developed macular degeneration and gets treatment for wet macular degeneration. So very vested in uh, the condition. And so it's important to him, it's, it's important to us. Um, but today we'll be talking about diabetes because it's another really important topic that because so many people have diabetes and just because someone has macular degeneration doesn't mean you can't have diabetes and vice versa. So it's a really important topic that, that we'll be talking about. So I introduced myself. And as I said, I, I get to do this with my uh, good friend and fellow optometrist, Dr. Paul Chaus. Um, Paul is an optometrist in Tacoma, Washington. And uh, he'll hate when I say this, I'm, I'm quite sure. But uh, Paul is probably well known amongst optometrists as being the most knowledgeable optometrist in the country, if maybe the world, I don't know, when it comes to diabetes, diabetes eye care. And um, so, you know, get ready with your questions because I'd rather ask Paul questions than, than a lot of, of, of primary care doctors or either endocrinologists because of his understanding, his ability to explain things, whether it's related to eyes or otherwise in general. So uh, we're really lucky to have Paul with us. He, to say he's a wealth of knowledge and information is uh, an understatement uh, beyond belief. So um, hopefully we'll take advantage of having Paul here with us. Um, so we're going to start with some prepared slides and remarks and then move on to questions and answers. But please feel free to send in any questions you have as we're going along. Um, we'll be monitoring and quite frankly, kind of waiting for questions because we, we really like the questions because then we know we're addressing what it is that you want to hear and not just what we have prepared. So please do send in any questions that you have. We're more than open to that. And we hope you enjoy the next 50 minutes or so of discussing diabetes. So, you know, one of the things that Paul and I talk about with optometrists all the time is just how many people have diabetes. So, um, so in the U.S., there are somewhere around 30 million people with diabetes. Yeah, the, the, the last estimate from the Centers for Disease Control is 37.3 million people with diabetes in the United States. And well, just as importantly, is there's about 90 million people with what's called pre-diabetes. Which, Paul, how, how would you describe what pre-diabetes is to people? Well, you know, any time, you know, diabetes is based on having a certain blood glucose level, depending on what test you do, right? So pre-diabetes means your blood sugar levels are higher than what's considered normal, but not quite high enough to kind of cross the thre threshold at which you're considered to have diabetes. But what we do know is that most patients with pre-diabetes, especially those who are younger, under the age of 80, eventually will go on and develop type 2 diabetes. So one condition leads to the other. Prediabetes is really an early form of type 2 diabetes, which is the most common form uh, in the world, in the world as well as the United States. Yeah. And as Paul mentioned, there's about 37 million people with diabetes. There's 90 million or so yeah. people with prediabetes. So um, that's why this is such an important topic because it affects so many people. And the projections are that it will be affecting more and more as time moves on. So it's estimated that there'll be about 100 million Americans by 2050 with diabetes. So what's the big deal? So diabetes is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States, leading cause of blindness in people under age 74, 
It's a leading cause of kidney failure, leading cause of non-traumatic amputation, and it costs a fortune. So in 2017, diabetes cost the economy in the U.S. about $327 billion with a B dollar. So diabetes, is it's pretty easy to make the argument that, it's, that it really is a big deal. Yeah, one in three Medicare dollars are spent on treating people with diabetes for complications. Eye care is actually a fraction of that. It's only about a billion dollars, only a billion. But, you know, the majority of the cost is associated with heart disease, you know, open heart surgery uh, and, and the like. So, you know, if we can prevent people from getting diabetes, that's really how you save money and improve the quality of life. So I wanted Paul to share with us a few diabetes myths. So things that are not true. Yeah, so diabetes occurs in a lot of people that are above ideal body weight, we'll say, but also in a lot of folks that don't, if you look at them, appear to be overweight or obese. So really what makes you uh, less sensitive to the effects of your own body's insulin is fat around your internal organs. It's not the fat under the skin, like maybe people carry on their you know buttocks or their or their thighs, but it's the the fat that's around your liver and the other internal organs that actually is different from fat under your skin. It secretes hormones. Fat is actually a tissue that secretes hormones. It's endocrine tissue. And those hormones that are secreted make you more insulin resistant, particularly in Asian folks, Asian Americans included. You know, a lot of folks develop type 2 diabetes at a much lower body weight than Caucasians or African Americans or Latinos. Another myth is that if you don't take medicine to control your diabetes, it means it's less serious. We know the moment you develop pre-diabetes, and certainly once you have type 2 diabetes, even if it's, quote, diet controlled, you're at significantly increased risk of cardiovascular complications. Is having type 2 diabetes better than having type 1? So I've had type 1 diabetes 50 three years now, and it's no picnic. But as it turns out, with type 2 diabetes, rates of uh, mortality of dying from heart disease and the like are higher. Many more people with type 2 diabetes actually lose their eyesight to diabetes simply because there's so many more people uh, that have type 2 diabetes than type 1. So you really don't want either type of diabetes. Type 2 diabetes not being hereditary is a fiction. It is hereditary. So if you have a first-degree relative, parent, or a sibling, uh, with diabetes, you're far more likely to get it. Actually, uh, it's more uh, linked to family members having type 2 diabetes than type 1 diabetes. Type 2, two patients don't go blind. I've already addressed that. M many more patients with type 2 diabetes lose their vision to diabetes than do type 1 patients just by the sheer numbers. That's about 92% of everybody that has diabetes is type 2. And I'll, this is a really big one from an eye, eye standpoint for Jeff and myself because a lot of people say, well, diabetes hasn't affected my eyes. I know because I can see just fine. And you know, that, that's a common misunderstanding of patients. You can have fabulous vision and really severe eye disease, particularly with diabetes, until the day you suddenly don't have good vision. So eye docs can detect problems long before you develop symptoms. And that's when you want to catch them. So these are all myths. So probably one of the most important messages that we could pass on to people is that, and that, that Paul just mentioned, good vision on an eye chart or in daily life does not equal healthy eyes. By the way, this is the same for macular degeneration. Just because you have good vision doesn't mean you don't have AMD. If you have diabetes and good vision, that does not mean you have healthy eyes. The only way that you know whether you have healthy eyes or not, Paul, is is having your eyes examined by somebody who knows what they're doing, right? And so, you know, the big three causes of blindness in the United States, diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration, and glaucoma. And these are largely asymptomatic diseases in their earliest stages when something can be done. So, you know, one of the main things that we worry about with people is developing something called diabetic retinopathy. And we won't go through all the details here, but just for you to know, Really, diabetes affects the small blood vessels in your body, and there's probably nowhere in your body where you have more of these tiny blood vessels than in your eyes. And so that means that, unfortunately, your eyes are a prime area to have leaky blood vessels or other problems with those, with those blood vessels. So that's why we worry so much about diabetic retinopathy. The retina is the back of the eye. It's the same area or part of the eye where the macula is. 
So very critical message. And again, Paul already mentioned this, is that diabetic retinopathy remains a leading cause of severe permanent vision loss in working age Americans. And important to that is you won't know if you have it unless you get your eyes checked and you have a real eye exam. And Jeff and I, by the way, we see patients quite frequently that have diabetic retinopathy that haven't even been diagnosed with diabetes yet. So this is actually a not uncommon finding in every eye doctor's office. Patients come in and they have eye signs, things we see inside the eye that lead us to believe a patient probably has diabetes. And more often than not, when the patient is referred in for uh, you know, more encompassing testing of their blood glucose levels, it turns out they do in fact have diabetes. Paul, we've mentioned about the importance of getting an eye exam. So who can do an appropriate eye exam? So, so that's a great question. So the, the people that have the best training at doing an eye exam would be a, a medical doctor with a subspecialty in ophthalmology or an optometrist who basically our entire graduate uh, education is focused on learning to recognize, diagnose, and appropriately manage people with all sorts of different eye diseases, including diabetic retinopathy and macular degeneration. So what about the when you go to get your driver's license and yeah. they screen your vision, does, or does that count? It does not count because, again, you can have great vision on a vision screening device. You might be able to see the letters at the Department of Licensing. But again, you could have very significant eye disease that could threaten your vision, you know, even within the next few days or weeks. So it's so critical. Somebody look inside the eye, ideally through a dilated pupil. So drops are put in to make your pupil larger. And this lets the eye doctor do two really important things. You can see more of the inside of the eye, more of the retina. And really importantly, you can see in 3D stereoscopically. You can look at the macula, very useful for detecting macular degeneration, glaucoma, but also swelling in the back of the eye due to diabetic retinopathy. So, Paul, we're getting a couple of questions, and I want to go ahead and have us address a couple of questions real quickly, then we'll come back to the content. So one of the questions that came in was, with diabetes, there are ups and downs in blood sugar levels. I have a continuous glucose monitor now and wonder how the highs and lows affect the eyes. Wow, that, that, that's a great question that a lot of times we hear from fellow optometrists when we when we do talks to optometrists. So Paul, how would, how would you answer that one? <laughs> so without you know getting too much into the, the biology, but here's the bottom line. Inside of every cell in our bodies, there's a little part of the cell called the mitochondria, and those produce the energy we need for our bodies to function. And so when your blood sugar levels are high, the sugar gets inside of the eye, even if you don't have any insulin, because parts of your body don't need insulin to get inside the cells. The retina is really highly metabolically active, so it needs a lot of sugar to do its job, right? So sugar gets inside, the mitochondria end up producing free radicals. So basically these are you know, chemicals that are oxidized. So you get a, a negative charge for those of you that remember any chemistry, maybe from high school, and that creates tissue damage. And we know that in people whose blood sugars go really high and then really low, you get more generation of these free radicals inside the eye, inside your kidneys, inside the heart. So the short of it is you want to try to keep your glucose as stable and in a relatively normal range as possible throughout the day. Perfect. Um, another question. So I've had diabetes since age 38. I had lupus and was treated with steroids. My diabetes has been under control, but I've been told that I will have diabetic eye problems. Why would that happen? So, you know, the first part of the answer to that would be that not everybody, most people, but not everybody develops diabetes related eye problems. So it's, it's not something that will happen for sure. Just like if you live to be 100, that doesn't mean you will get age-related macular degeneration. Your odds go up as you age, but it doesn't mean you will. So if you have diabetes and don't have any eye problems yet, that's fantastic. And the, the biggest risk factors for developing eye-related problems from diabetes are how long you've had diabetes, your blood sugar control, and your blood pressure control. So if you have good control of your blood pressure and your blood sugar, then you're at least addressing two of the three main risk factors. So you may not develop eye problems. By the way, we should also add that many people develop problems in the eyes or findings in the eyes that don't affect vision. 
So just because an eye doctor finds something doesn't mean you will lose vision necessarily. The majority of patients with diabetic retinopathy never go on and lose vision. A small subset do. And unfortunately, we don't always know who's going to progress on and get worse. But a quick thing I'll just mention, I'll try to explain it simply. There's, it, it's a phenomenon that if your blood sugars are high for a long time, even though you get good blood sugar control down the down the road, as it were, you still remain at a significantly higher risk of getting more severe diabetic retinopathy. So that's why it's really important if you get diabetes to try to get good control early on. This phenomena of lousy control early on, you get everything right, and then you still get complications is referred to as metabolic memory. It's kind of like your body remembers how shabbily it was treated in terms of having high blood glucose level, and that can lead to problems down the road. So really important to try to get good control early on. What does good control mean? What do you think, Jeff? What does good control mean? <laughs> so, you know, the the question said that they use a continuous glucose monitor. Yes. So that's something that you can wear that basically tells you what your blood sugar is all the time. And good control means that you're within a range between 70 and 180 the majority of the day. Yeah. And the continuous monitors let you know that. Yeah. The, these continuous monitors are really game changers. And so there is uh, research out there that shows Patients with diabetes who wear a continuous glucose monitor or a CGM, they're made by companies you might see on TV, the Freestyle Libra made by Abbott Diabetes Care. There's one called Dexcom. I think they're actually here in San Diego. You know, the various companies that make these monitors. But the bottom line here is that patients who wear continuous glucose monitors are less likely to develop diabetes complications, especially eye complications. So I applaud you for wearing a CGM continuous glucose monitor. And right now, you know, about 40% of patients with type one diabetes, what I have, wear them. And it's only about 10% of people with type two. But I think as time goes by, we're going to see more and more people with type two diabetes using these continuous glucose monitoring systems. All right. So let's jump back to a couple of the slides for a few minutes and we'll jump back into questions. So keep sending the questions in. We, you know, like, like I was trying to say, that's really our favorite part about doing these talks. So a critical message that, that Paul already addressed that many patients with really bad eye problems see great until they don't. And so I know we've said it a couple of times, but the importance of routine eye care, I think just cannot be uh, overstated. So this is what it might look like in someone's eye that has a bad problem from diabetes. And so this really dark area is an area of hemorrhage, of bleeding in the eye. So this is someone that probably saw great the day before but is in the office today saying, I don't see much of anything. And if they would have been seen a month earlier, six months earlier, then it could have been diagnosed, treated, and hopefully have this prevented. Yeah, so the macula there is underneath all that big red mass. You know, I call this a boat hemorrhage. It kind of looks like a sailboat with a with a keel going down, right? So the macula is blocked. So this patient basically sees nothing, maybe some light, maybe some movement, but is not going to be able to read the biggest of the biggest letters we can show them on an eye chart. So to Paul's point, the, the vast majority, about 90% of real vision loss and diabetes is preventable with early detection. So again, I know we keep saying the same thing, but it's just so much more important than, than, than we can possibly emphasize. So Paul, why don't people with diabetes get their eyes checked annually? What, what are some of the reasons? For 50 years, eye docs have been talking about this. We know roughly half of patients with diabetes don't get their eyes examined as they're supposed to on a regular annual basis, or at least even every other year. And the main reason that's been found is that patients didn't perceive a need. And what patients who lose vision will typically say is, I didn't realize diabetes could affect my vision this profoundly. So now you know, so you're not gonna make that mistake, right? You wanna go in, even if everything seems fine to you, that means nothing because you can have severe eye disease. What, else, what other reasons are out? I mean, lack of access to insurance, you know, lack of access to an eye doctor, depending on the community you live in. Some people say transportation barriers are an issue. So there are programs in a lot of communities, uh, particularly for uh, senior citizens, to get transportation to doctor's appointments, including eye doctors. So that's something that, you know, you should investigate in your own community if there are transportation barriers. Any others that you see, Jeff, that, that block people from getting their eyes checked? You know, I, I think I think the biggest one you already mentioned is the perception that don't need it. Yeah. 
So I, I think that's by far the biggest one. Um, but there, there's, there's a long list of potential reasons, but most importantly, now you know the importance. Let's hop back over to a couple questions here. Um, so I think we'll address this later, but since the question came in, we'll address this now. And so by the way, some of these topics, when Paul and I talked to optometrists, sometimes we talk about some of these individual slides for up to half an hour or an hour to eye doctor. So it's, it's really hard to get all this in and try to tell you everything we want. Um, and this next question in particular is something we could talk about for an hour. Uh, is there a special diet that I should be following or vitamins? That's really tough because um, it, it's, it's not easy, but I think we can boil it down to fairly, I'll give you my very short answer and we'll, we'll have Paul add on to it. I think that uh, as far as diet, uh, more fruits and vegetables, less refined carbohydrates, and oftentimes what I tell patients is less white foods. So white foods include pasta, bread, rice, uh, Potato. potatoes, and unfortunately, most ice cream. <laughs> so um, that's, gen that's my very basic information. If you've heard of something called the Mediterranean diet, that is very, very healthy for people with diabetes or anybody. Uh, Paul, what would you add to that? So, so a specific finding from this study done in Spain called the PREDIMED trial, they looked at different forms of the Mediterranean diet, which kind of features, you know, olive oil, avocados, nuts from trees. So, you know, almonds, pistachios, walnuts and the like, uh, a little bit of red wine, <laughs> a lot of plant food. So, you know, more more plants, more vegetables, some fruit, and you want to stay away from fruit juice because that makes your blood sugar go up really rapidly. But in this particular trial, what was shown is that the patients with diabetes who ate two servings of oily fish a week, so this is like, you know, a handful of salmon or mackerel or, you know, other fatty fish. Sardines. Sardines are great and they're inexpensive if you can stomach them. But the people that had two servings a week were half as likely to end up with severe diabetic retinopathy. So I would I would emphasize oily fish consumption to patients and less refined sugars, as Jeff has already so wisely said. You know, the other part of the question was, are there vitamins you can take? And so uh, yeah, kind of a two-part answer. One is if you have a healthy diet with enough fruits and vegetables, plant food, then I don't know that you necessarily need a specific vitamin. However, and Paul wouldn't, wouldn't talk about this, so I will. Actually, Paul has had an a, uh, article published in a journal called the British Journal of Ophthalmology that talked about that if you take the right eye vitamin, a specific eye vitamin, that you can Im potentially improve your vision some, maybe prevent eye problems. It was hard to be able to tell that, but also do some other really good things in regards to diabetes without making your blood sugar go too low. So more important than vitamins are a healthy diet, but there are eye specific vitamins for people with diabetes. Just like the ARIDS formula, right, is recommended to folks once they get a certain level of dry macular degeneration. There are a couple of products available now specifically targeted at folks that have diabetes. And there's some evidence that we don't know yet because you need a lot of years to find out, will it prevent blindness? But we know we can improve people's vision, their color vision, their ability to see at night, their peripheral vision, things of that nature. All right. So my father's family developed diabetes in their 80s. Mine came much sooner. Why? Um, you know, good question, because <laughs> obviously, ideally, you want to put it off as long as you can to prevent complications. But, you know, really the, the causes for diabetes, I think very simply put, could be that it's both nature and nurture. So it's both your genetics and your lifestyle, things that you do, things that you encounter, anything from your diet to how much you exercise to the air pollution that you're subjected to um, and many other things. So it might just be that some of the other things that are risk factors that you are more exposed to them at an earlier age than other people in your family. And we've created a world that is toxic and increases rates of diabetes. We sit on our rear ends a little bit too long as we're driving to, to and from work. A lot of us have jobs behind a desk and the like. To Jeff's point, if you live near a freeway, you're way more likely to get diabetes, even if you're wealthy and live near the freeway. And it's been attributed to small particle air pollution, these little tiny particles that get into your bloodstream via your lungs, and they increase inflammation, increase your risk for developing insulin resistance. And that's the hallmark 
of type two diabetes. Another, the other person who asked a question earlier said they were treated with steroids for lupus. And we know a lot of patients develop diabetes once they're put on steroid treatments. We know COVID itself uh, dramatically increased rates of diabetes in the United States. So any inflammatory process and the use of steroids to control the inflammation, they both, opposite sides of the same coin, increase rates of diabetes. So here's a really good statistic that I, Jeff and I like to share with our patients. You know, your hemoglobin A1C, what is that? It's a measurement basically of how much sugar stuck to your blood cells for 60 to 90 days. The blood cells kind of turn over. They die and get removed typically by your spleen every 90 days. So by measuring how much sugar is stuck to your red blood cells that have died, you get a sense of what the person's blood sugar levels were during the, the prior uh, six to nine months. So an A1C is usually a number, it's a percentage. So normal would be 5%, let's say. Abnormal is 6.5%. Most people with diabetes have A1C levels above eight. And so if you can lower your A1C, make a simple case, let's say your A1C is 10. That means your average blood sugar is somewhere around 250. If you can lower the A1C by 10%, so 10% of 10 is point, uh, is 10, it's one. one, it's one. <laughs> so you go down to 9%, that's still too high, but by simply reducing your A1C from 10 to nine, you reduce your risk of developing diabetic retinopathy, retinopathy by more than 40%. Yeah, so it's it's big bang for your buck. Yeah. A little bit of improvement in your blood sugar control creates a huge improvement in likelihood of having problems. So Paul's already talked a little bit about continuous glucose monitors, and we mentioned time and range, what percent of the day your blood sugar is between 70 and 180. And we realize that most people with diabetes don't have these monitors yet, but as Paul mentioned, Moving forward in time, hopefully most people will. And similar to the statistic that Paul just said, if people can have their time and range 70% um, uh, of the time, it dramatically decreases the risk of them developing eye problems, kidney problems, or virtually any other problem. A 10% worsening of your time and range equals a 60% uh, increased risk of eye problems. So again, just small improvements in blood sugar control equal a huge improvement in your odds of doing well with virtually any complication related to diabetes. So generally want your A1C number to be lower and your time and range to be higher. They can, they're related to one another, but they're actually distinct because time and range is not measuring kind of the average, it's measuring your point by point, minute by minute blood glucose level. So it's a more accurate way to assess this. These are just examples of different systems out there. The most common one there is on the upper left. So you wear this little patch on your arm. There's a little wire. It's a sensor that goes under your skin. Doesn't hurt to put it on. You scan it with a little reader. You can now do it with your, with your cell phone if you have one. And it'll immediately tell you what your blood sugar is that moment in time. They refer to this as flash glucose sensing. It's you get, you, you get a quick picture of what's going on, but it's always working in the background and can, can uh, calculate for you your time and range. We see on the bottom left, there are two individuals. One's, one person's blood sugar is 71, and that's, that's a good blood sugar. But if you look at the arrow, it's pointing down. That means that patient's blood sugar is dropping very rapidly. Happened to me this morning. I woke Jeff up because it was alarming. And that, that's what's really nice about these devices. If you get too low, or too high, they vibrate, they make a noise, they alert you to take action so you can get your glucose back into a normal range. The person on the bottom left, but on the right side, the yellow one, the blood sugar's 202 and it's going up, not rapidly, but it is going up. There's that little angled up arrow. And then on the bottom right there, you see somebody that's wearing one of these continuous glucose sensors. This is the Dexcom device. Uh, and, they're, and typically, you know, patients wear these on their arm or their abdomen most commonly. And they do a great job of not just monitoring, but people do better. They tend to have better control just by having one. This is just a graph that's showing that that 70% time and range is kind of like the magic number. If you can, if people can be at that level or more time and range, the odds of problems go down dramatically. Eyes and kidneys, and now it's turning out even some cardiovascular problems. Is there a link between blood sugar and age-related macular degeneration? There appears to be. So in the ARIDS trial, what was shown is that people that ate more foods that make their blood sugar go up were significantly more likely 
to get advanced age-related macular degeneration. And in fact, if you look at the numbers, eating a low carbohydrate, low refined carbohydrate diet, avoiding the white foods Jeff alluded to earlier, that was almost as effective as taking the ARIDS formula, taking the ARIDS eye vitamin. So what I try to tell my patients, do both, right? You want, you want to hit any eye disease, including AMD, from as many angles as you possibly can. Okay, so, you know, it's important, again, here comes, the, you know, what we mentioned before, that some patient perceptions that people with diabetes are frequently unaware about the importance of eye exams, how frequently to have eye exams, and how asymptomatic, no, no signs to them, no symptoms of having problems can be. So we talked about the first and third, Jeff. What about the recommended frequency? What do you tell your patients about how often they should come in? Yeah, so I think if someone, is, once they're diagnosed with diabetes, so if someone is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, they need to make sure they have their eyes checked, especially if they haven't had them checked recently. But then once you have that done, it's annually, unless you start to develop changes that require it to be more frequent than that. And that's something that your eye doctor can let you know. If you, know, if you go to an eye doctor and you have diabetes and they say, we'll see you in four years, that's probably a little bit too long. That's too long. So how often <laughs> should I get my eyes examined? See, we're a step ahead of ourselves at least once a year. Um, what are the most common, Paul, what's the most common symptom of diabetic retinopathy? No symptoms. So most patients I see that have bleeding in their eye, they've got eye damage, they report no symptoms whatsoever. They can read the bottom line on the eye chart because it hasn't gotten bad enough for it to affect somebody's vision. So again, we've hit this message multiple times, but it's so important. Again, 90 or even more percent of all blindness from diabetes can be prevented if it's detected early on and patients are counseled and treated when they need to be treated. So Paul, we've mentioned uh, treatment a couple of times. So what are some of the treatment options for diabetic eye disease? So the first thing is to try to you know, control your blood pressure and to some extent, lower your blood sugar. Although as it turns out, that's not as helpful as, as we would hope it would be. It's kind of like the horse gets out of the barn. If your diabetic retinopathy gets past a certain point, actually improving your blood sugar control is not that helpful. It tends to progress on due to this phenomenon I alluded to earlier, metabolic memory. But the treatments are generally laser treatment. So you basically are sealing leaky blood vessels or you're destroying intentionally parts of the retina so the eye doesn't need as much oxygen, as much circulation. So you're turning off the chemical signals that make abnormal blood vessels grow in the back of the eye. And that's what causes classic total blindness from diabetes. But the other super you know, important treatment has come out here in the last 20 years has been these injections into the eye, the same ones that are used in AMD, vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors, VEGF inhibitors. And there's several different drugs on the market. They all do a bang up job at reducing your diabetic retinopathy severity, and in many cases, improving patients' vision. Yeah, so I think that's an important thing to, to touch on for a minute is that, like Paul said, the, uh, the injections, just like what, what people get for macular degeneration, are most oftentimes a treatment for diabetes-related eye problems. Um, Paul, do, do the injections hurt? No, I mean, so I've, I've probably stolen this line from Jeff, but what I tell my patients now is that the worst thing about getting an injection into the eye is hearing you might be getting an injection in the eye. You know, I took insulin injections for 30 years before I got a pump and really an injection into the eye, I've had a few of them, doesn't hurt any more than an injection, you know, into your arm or into your stomach or your thigh. So it's, it, they generally don't hurt. All right. So, you know, as far as symptoms, we've said oftentimes no symptoms, but some people do have symptoms. Sometimes there could be a blind spot. Sometimes there could be kind of a red blob. Sometimes it could just be general blur. Sometimes it could be that everything is just kind of cloudy. It's really, it could really, I think the symptoms can be virtually anything that's not normal vision. Right. Um, so, you know, you don't know if you, almost any symptom you have with your vision, it's hard to know what it is unless you go to an eye doctor 
to have it diagnosed, okay, what, you know, what is this? Why am I not seeing as well? We know that about half of patients with diabetes have color vision abnormalities too, but sometimes they're so subtle that patients don't pick up on them. And also cataracts, which happen to all of us, by the way, 100% of people get cataracts if you live long enough. They always happen, but cataracts also can muck up your perception of color in the real world. So Paul, we've, we've touched on blood pressure a couple of times and Joanne is asking what range of blood pressure is most desirable? Mine has been lowered because I've been on a diabetes prevention program, but I'm wondering if it's getting too low. It's a great question. So a bunch of large, you know, placebo controlled clinical trials have been done in the last 40 years to look exactly at the question you're asking, Joanne. So the recommendation is that if you have any heart disease, right? So you've got uh, a stent put in, you want your blood pressure to be 130 on the top number, 80 or lower on the bottom. But if you don't have any cardiovascular disease, the general cutoff point is get your top number 140 or less, the bottom number under 90. What's also really helpful in diabetes are drugs that end in pril, lisinopril, enalapril, captopril, these are called ACE inhibitors. You don't have to worry about that. But the drugs that end in Pril or Sartin, Losartin, Valsartin, these are drugs that protect you from kidney failure. They also, as it turns out, lower the risk of developing diabetic retinopathy. Great question. That's a, that's a really practical one. So what are some other signs or symptoms you may have? You may have floaters in your vision. You may have distortion in your vision. Paul mentioned the color perception or some sudden change where maybe part of your vision is missing or different than it was maybe even the day before. But again, most commonly, no symptoms. So we, we also think it's important for everyone to realize that good control does not eliminate the risk of problems. So we have some percentages listed here, but really what, what's important to know is even if you haven't had diabetes long, even if you have great control of your blood pressure and your blood sugar, sometimes things still happen. And so again, comes back to the point of make sure to be getting routine eye care. Um, there's a question, if you have laser treatments, will you not lose vision? So lasers are used a lot less commonly today than they were five, 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, but regardless of whether it's laser treatment or the injections, if you need either one and you have either one, they dramatically decrease the risk of losing vision. They don't bring it to zero, unfortunately. And that's why if, you're, if you need treatment, you want to get it done as early in the process as possible, because as the disease gets worse, laser cannot always pull people back from the edge of the cliff. And that's what we're all trying to do in eye care. And that's what every patient wants too, is right. You don't want to fall off the cliff and have permanent vision loss. So these treatments can typically pull patients back, but even with the best treatments available, sometimes patients have permanent severe vision loss. The goal is to get rid of it to the highest extent we possibly can, of course. So we've been talking about the importance of getting your eyes checked. What should you be asking of your eye doctor when you go and get your eyes checked? Because if you go with a plan, then I think you can better ensure that you have the outcomes and information, <clears throat> excuse me, that you need. So here, here's some simple questions that Paul came up with that really anyone with diabetes going to get their eyes checked should ask their eye doctor. And you could do it with respect to macular degeneration too, right? I'm sure, you know, if you've been to any of these past uh, meetings, you've learned about macular degeneration and retinal drusen, right? These little fat deposits. You could ask the same question. You know, do I have any signs of diabetic retinopathy? Do I have any signs of AMD in my eyes? I think if patients are proactive about that, hopefully you have a communicative doctor. My experience has been a lot of eye doctors are very quiet, right? We're circumspect. We write stuff down and say, yeah, come back in a year. I try to talk to my patient as I'm doing the exam to let them know what I'm looking for. If, you're, if your doc's not talking to you, ask her or him to talk to you about what their findings are. Yeah. And then really importantly, you know, when do you want me back? And will you send a report of today's findings to my primary care doctor or endocrinologist? All your different doctors should be coordinating and communicating with each other to ensure best care for you. And ideally, I'm just gonna make a plug here. Eye doctors, we do a pretty good job of sending reports to your family doctor, your endocrinologist, if you see a diabetes specialist. But a lot of times we in, in eye care don't get letters back from the primary care docs. And it would be really nice. You can make a pitch to your own doctor. If I'm going to the eye doctor, could you let me know or send my, my eye doctor a note about 
what blood pressure level you're recommending for me, what level of blood sugar control you're recommending. Because ideally, every one of your healthcare providers is going to give you messages that reinforce one another, right? So Paul, you just brought up about the blood sugar. So one of the questions we got is my A1C is 8.0. Is that acceptable? It's not. It's the threshold for poor control. So when you get eight or above endocrinology, kind of the most expertise in diabetes management, say that if you're 8% or above, that's poor blood sugar control. There are exceptions, though. If you're at the end of your life, if you have a lot of complications, if you have cognitive decline and can't you know, uh, think clearly about your treatment regimen, sometimes we let patients A1Cs run a little higher because there is some increasing risk for people if their blood sugars get too low. But in general, if you're if you have a relatively normal lifespan remaining, you know, more than 10 years and you're cognitively functioning, eight is too high. That's the average A1C in the diabetes population in the United States. It should be seven or under for most patients. So you need to have an honest discussion with your PCP. We know a lot of doctors don't give you more medicines because they're afraid of making patients upset by giving them more medications. Believe me, get your blood sugar down. It'll lower the risk of every single diabetes complication, especially blindness. All right. So a question that just came in here. I just got an eye injection for an eye hemorrhage located outside of the retina. I do have dry macular degeneration. Could the injection I received help my macular degeneration? So, you know, really kind of what that goes back to is a couple of things we've, we've kind of touched on. One, just because you have one condition doesn't mean you can't or don't have the other. And so injections for macular degeneration are the same injections given for diabetes and vice versa. So yes, if you have an injection for one, it will indirectly help the other. Now, if you have dry macular degeneration, though, the injections don't do anything because you don't need it in the first place. Yeah. And, you know, so you're not injected because of a hemorrhage on or within the retina. It's only if you have hemorrhaging below the retina, as typically happens in wet macular degeneration. Right. Good point of distinction. Um, all right. So, um, so how can people with diabetes help their eye doctor to do a better job? So this is kind of pointed to things that hopefully your eye doctor would want to know. Know your latest A1C, or if you use a continuous glucose monitor, your time and range. Bring a list of all your medications, not just, I think I take medicine for something with my heart. Right. That doesn't tell us, or I think I take a blood pressure medication. Because as Paul mentioned, there's some blood pressure medications that are really good for the eyes and are preventative of eye problems. And there's other blood pressure medications that I wouldn't say they worsen eye problems, but they lead to more likelihood of- They could aggravate it. So, you know, remember your eyeballs are connected to the rest of your body. So in fact, even though you may not <clears throat> see the direct connection, a lot of systemic medications have side effects or positive effects, good and bad effects in the eyes. So tell your eye doctor all the medicines you're on. Uh, be prepared to have drops put in your eyes to have your eyes dilated, just like what Paul was talking about earlier. And uh, know the name of your primary care doctor, endocrinologist, whatever other doctors you see to facilitate communication. So, you know, my, my doctor is the one that's over on the other street and the, it doesn't let us send letters, right? Or saying my A1C is good or my A1C is 120. You know, we kind of know what you mean, but learn what A1C values are. You know, it's typically a number somewhere between, you know, 5% up to seeing patients with A1C of 16%. They generally don't do very well, but know your actual A1C. And as Jeff said, your time in range, if you wear a glucose monitor. All right. So some critical messages. Again, we've touched on this good vision on an eye chart or daily life does not equal healthy eyes. That Patients must, you must consistently be reminded by all members of your care team about the importance of eye exams and when to do it. Why do your family doctors want to know if you had an eye exam? Well, because they know the eyes are connected to the rest of your body. If you have diabetic retinopathy, you have a higher risk for having heart disease, for instance. Your PCP needs to know that, right? And so try to you know, encourage all your healthcare team to communicate with each other and with you. You're the captain of the ship if you have diabetes. You need to help your providers and encourage them, insist that they talk to each other. I, I love that <laughs> analogy that you're you're the captain of your ship. 
Um, because really, I think the way then to think of all of your healthcare providers as is they're they're the workers on your ship. They are, and they're working for you, right? Not the other way around. Right. And so, you know, we we need to be able to to lead our own ship. So I, I like that one, Paul. Um, let me answer this question. Um, can you name good and bad blood pressure medicines for my eyes, or source where I can find the information? So Paul, so Paul already mentioned um, medications that end in pril. And the most common one is lisinopril or uh, medications that end in sartan. Um, low sartan is the most common of those are really good for, uh, for diabetic retinopathy. Yeah. Uh, as far as medications that are not as good, probably the most important example is something called hydrochlorothiazide, HCTZ. It works great for lowering, for lowering blood pressure and it's really inexpensive. However, not so good for the eyes. Well, in high doses, it makes your blood glucose levels go up. So a high dose is 50 milligrams or higher. Sorry to get down into the weeds, but if you're on a low dose of HCTZ, hydrochlorothiazide, it's a water pill, makes you pee all the time. If you're on a higher dose, it worsens your blood glucose levels. And another drug I'll just mention are the statin drugs. There's Fairly good evidence that if you're on a statin, it actually is beneficial, helps lower the risk of developing diabetic retinopathy. So that, that was a really good question. All right. So another critical message. Uh, nearly all patients who live with diabetes long enough will develop some degree of diabetic retinopathy, but the goal is to keep it from becoming severe and to get it diagnosed and treated if it becomes severe. So basically saying that just because you develop changes in your eyes, that's not good, but it doesn't have to lead to a bad outcome. It just means, okay, we need to maybe follow you a little more closely and treat as needed. Um, we mentioned monitoring vision. You know, so somebody asked about how should I monitor my vision um, at home for changes. And so, you know, the answer that I would give you for this is a little bit different for this than uh, I would give you for macular degeneration. Because one of the things we talk about a lot for macular degeneration, especially if you have a certain level intermediate, is using an at-home monitoring device called 4C Home. So 4C Home is, works wonderfully well for macular degeneration. However, it does not work in diabetes. So it's not a tool for people with diabetes. And you know, there's grids you can use called an Amsler grid. Generally, what I tell people to do is, you know, what's your source of news intake? Is it a newspaper? Is it Yahoo? What is it? And once or twice a week, cover one eye, cover the other. Does it look the same between the two? Does it look the same as it did the last time? And so that's a really informal way to check vision, but I think it's at least a way to have a gross check of vision. But remember, good vision does not mean healthy eyes. Nor does bad vision mean you have damaged eyes, right? A lot of people just need their eyeglass prescription updated, right? There's a lot of people with diabetes that have suboptimal vision that could be improved by having a better glasses prescription. You got to see an eye doctor. That's the bottom line. Relying on you picking up the disease, it's going to get out of control before you have any symptoms that are noticeable more, more often than not. So another critical message that Paul mentioned earlier, almost all severe vision loss from diabetes is preventable. And that's really important because, you know, one of the things that we really try to do with our patients is prevent undue anxiety. And as long as people are receiving appropriate care, the vast majority of people do really, really well. Um, is diabetes associated with eye problems other than retinopathy? Yes, Paul already mentioned and talked a little bit about this. Cataracts tend to happen earlier. Glaucoma is more common. Dry eye is more common. And there are many more different eye conditions that are more common in people with diabetes. By now, you can probably guess what we would say, how you find out about that. And I know it sounds like a plug for ourselves, but it's, it's not. It's, it's really the most important thing to good eye health is identifying issues when and if they are present. So Jeff has a good line, which is diabetes only affects parts of the body where there are nerves or blood vessels or proteins. That's everywhere. So if you look up any disease known to man, you can do a Google search and you say diabetes and this medical diagnosis, you'll find that the overwhelming majority, the risk is higher if you have diabetes. 
So how do you find a good eye doctor? Um, so we already kind of mentioned that for your, for your routine care, uh, either going to see a doctor of optometry, an optometrist, or an ophthalmologist are going, most will do a great job at being able to diagnose any problems that there are. If you have certain problems that require treatment, especially retinopathy, problems with the retina, the back of the eye, you would most likely be sent to a retina specialist, which is the same person you would be sent to if you have wet macular degeneration. So, you know, if you don't know if someone's a good choice, you can ask them when you call the office, do you see a lot of patients with diabetes? Um, you can gauge a doctor's engagement by, do they talk to you about prevention? So is it not just your vision's good today, see in a year? There's really, any good eye doctor should be mentioning the importance of controlling your blood pressure, your blood glucose, or do you use a continuous glucose monitor? And then asking about equipment. Do you have the equipment to properly image my eyes? <clears throat> asking friends and family. That's a great way to find out a good provider, whether it's an eye doctor or any other medical professional. And ask your other doctors. Um, you know, hopefully, an eye, as an eye doctor, we both have good relationships with a number of primary care doctors and endocrinologists that we share patients with that we both feel comfortable with each other. So that if my patient asks me, well, where's an endocrinologist I can go to? I know where to send them. And if, if a primary care, if, you know, you ask your primary care doctor, where's a good eye doctor? They'll tell you to go see Paul. So asking people for help is always a good option. Um, make sure that, you know, again, so you or your loved one with, with diabetes, get your eyes checked uh, at appropriate intervals. There's some great resources, American Diabetes Association. We have a couple websites. Again, Paul will hate it, but Paul wrote a book that's great. And it's called Diabetic Eye Disease, Lessons from a Diabetic Eye Doctor. And so he wrote it about his experiences as a patient with diabetes for decades, along with his, 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 uh, his knowledge as a really smart eye doctor. And so it's kind of combining those two. It's in large print, written at a third grade level. So, which is the level at which I function <laughs> <laughs> a little higher than that, um, but it's a great, great resource. Um, and it's something that I believe we either do or will be having on the macular degeneration association website. So that's an easy place you can go to get this book. It's just great information for you and your family, because it's important, not just for you to be informed, but your family as well, so that they can help you uh, with your journey. Maybe you and I can make a movie and maybe you'll star in the movie with me about the book. Now, it's not that kind of book. It's not, <laughs> it's not a novel. It, it, it will never be uh, a, a Hollywood hit. <laughs> so another question that came in, my heart doctor uh, had me start Jardians, which is really expensive. What's your opinion of this? It's a great drug. So in Europe, you get type 2 diabetes, the first drug they put you on. Jardians. Why? Because it's been shown to dramatically lower your risk of dying or having kidney failure, or ending up with congestive heart failure, a stroke, or a heart attack. And so Europe has figured out it's better to pay on the front end for drugs that protect you from these complications, rather than treat you for the end stage effects of the disease, like open heart surgery, right? Jardines is a great drug. If you have any pre-existing heart condition, there are uh, you know, typically Medicare will cover Jardians for patients that have pre-existing heart disease. If you don't have Medicare yet, yet, I assume most of the listeners probably are of Medicare age, but that may be wrong. A lot of these drug companies that make drugs like Jardians have coupons. So I've been on a drug, another company's drug called Farxiga, that's just like Jardians. And I have paid $0 for it. I've been on it now for eight years because I got a drug coupon. So once I get to Medicare age, it's one of these deals where they're going to stop covering the drug, okay? So it, in my view, it's worth every penny unless, you know, you you can't eat because you're, you know, you're buying Jardians. But Jardians, Farxiga, Invokana, these drugs are all in the same class. They're drugs that make you pee away high blood sugar. So it opens up a little gate in your bladder that lets the sugar out of your bloodstream into the bladder. When you're peeing away the sugar, your blood sugar goes down you lose weight, your arteries get less rigid. That means they're more flexible. That means you're less likely to have a stroke or a heart attack. And they also protect your kidneys. So these drugs are called SGLT2 inhibitors. You don't need to know that. Just remember the names. The best of the bunch is Jardians, also known as Empagliflozin. Eventually it's going to go generic and the cost will come down. 
or the United States will get its you know head out of the the wrong place, <laughs> the wrong orifice, and start you know. So diabetes drugs recently, insulin prices were capped, and there's an internal medicine doc that wrote an editorial for the uh, New York Times, and he said uh, capping the price of insulin is going to kill patients. So why might that be? Well, if you need insulin, it's not going to kill you, but the thought is that if drugs are cheap, doctors are more likely to use the cheaper drugs. That's what's done now. So instead of putting patients on drugs that protect you from having a heart attack or a stroke, like Jardians, your doc may put you purely for financial reasons on drugs like insulin that lower your blood sugar a lot. It's Don't get me wrong, it's a life-saving drug, but it does not reduce your heart disease risk like Jardians does. And I don't work for the company that makes Jardians, just so you know. Yeah, it's a you know the price of medications for diabetes is a problem. It is that it's it's uh, they've they they've risen more quickly than almost any other class of medication historically. We should advocate in the diabetes community for all you know diabetes meds, especially the ones that protect you from heart disease, to have kind of a lid on how much can be charged for them. And I think you know it's a little bit of a socialist uh, <laughs> way of operating a healthcare system, but I think you know you have to put public health front and center of any healthcare system. So one more question. And then, um, so if, if you have any other questions, kind of last call, uh, it says, I try to keep my highs below 180. Is this helpful to protect the eyes or do I need to make sure the spikes are not that high? Is there a directive to keep your spikes below a certain number? So, you know, so technically if it's below 180, you're still within range of time and range. But the, the, the question is a good one because What's really harmful is not always being a little bit high. It's occasionally going way too high. And so, if, you know, if, if someone can keep, you know, if, if the spikes are below 160, that's better than below 180. But I think yeah, I, I'd be interested in your take, Paul. I think if you're below 180, that's acceptable. It, Lower than that would be better. We know that when your blood sugar gets to about 180, it actually starts to damage the blood vessels in your eyes specifically. So keeping it at under 180 consistently is a really good idea. You want to try, you know, an ideal blood glucose level is going to vary a little bit from patient to patient, but two hours after the biggest meal of your day, ideally you want your blood glucose level to be 150 or lower. All right. So we got to all the questions. Um, so Paul and I want to thank you for attending today. Hopefully everyone was able to take away, uh, something interesting, something that, uh, they'll be able to use actually one last question that just came in. So we'll answer this last one. Um, and then, you know, kind of interestingly. So as I mentioned, the reason we're at a hotel, we're at a conference. So when we're done here, we're going to go speak to a room of optometrists on same topic, some of the same, same slides, same issues, uh, to eye doctors. So um, you'll be you'll be really connected. You'll have the same information. Uh, so this uh, person is saying, I've had prediabetes since 2007 and have managed to not progress to diabetes. Awesome. That is fantastic. My doctor mentions metformin occasionally. I've been resistant. Is this the drug of choice? Well, you know, the drug of choice is actually whatever it is that you've been doing. And so likely you've been paying attention to the food you eat and you've been getting some exercise. And so the recommendation, if you have prediabetes, is 30 minutes of exercise, five days a week. And if you can do that, that's, that's better than metformin. Um, so whatever you've been doing for the last 15 years has been working great. Again, lifestyle is important. Uh, historically, uh, metformin would be the drug of choice for somebody with prediabetes. Paul, is that, I think that tide might be, is it shifting a little bit? A little bit towards some of these more cardio protective drugs, but metformin's dirt cheap. We know if you're on metformin rather than other drugs like insulin, your risk of developing heart disease goes down. Your risk of cancer goes down. Metformin, even if you don't have diabetes, lowers the risk of colorectal cancer pretty significantly. So I know, I know a lot of doctors without diabetes that take metformin because they have a family history of colorectal cancer. Keep doing what you're doing. You know, if you're blood glucose kind of is continuing to go up, there may be an argument for adding a little metformin into the regimen. Just know that metformin is a, rel I shouldn't say relatively, it's a very safe drug. It's been used for decades now. Do I think Jardiance is better? Yes, it is. It's way more expensive. Another drug that I'm a fan of talking to patients about is called Synjardi. It's a little metformin, a little bit of Jardiance in one pill. And so you get the benefits of both drugs in one pill. But again, it's expensive. By the way, metformin 
uh, is thought to actually help reduce the risk of macular degeneration as yeah, well. There's that's... some some publications on that this year. So, um, so yeah, whatever you've been doing, but metformin may be the next step. Thank you again for attending. <clears throat> Thank you, Paul, for uh, sharing some of your wisdom with us. It's been an honor. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, everybody.